Well, good day to you. Oh, it would be a pretty good day here if the weather would cooperate. Seems like old man uh, weather winter's grip isn't quite gone yet. Now, remember this when I'm complaining about how hot it is in, you know, another three months. But it could be worse. Uh, at least I'm inside and it's warm. we got things to do today. Uh, we start work on this uh, little GE clock radio a little bit. I'm going to just show you quick some of the tools I got a hold of. That uh, I got most of this for about five bucks. I showed you that screwdriver already. Um, all these solder irons came in a box, and I got two rolls of solder. There's a big roll of solder there. It's pretty fine, but a big roll. And there's a smaller roll with. I don't know, there's probably at least 10 feet of solder on there. You know, a lot of people see these little rolls and go, oh, that's kind of dumb, I'm not going to buy that. Well, go buy a roll of solder. It's expensive, and you can't get um, lead-based solder anymore. It's evil for some reason. There's a little, uh, there's a little soldering stand and a little soldering pencil, or iron, electric iron, I guess. This is a Sears. Um, it's about 27 watt. Since Sears never really makes anything of their own, I bet this is an Unger. It's not a Weller, that's for darn sure. Uh, tips might be a little bit scarce, but you know what? Uh, all it has to do is last long enough to get through this project. Oh, uh, the good old Weller solder iron. That's a Weller, I think that's a Junior. No, that's an Elite. And uh, that's about you know, 100 watts and 140 watts with a single bulb. These things are kind of a workhorse. Of the universe. So we got plenty of soldering irons and guns and other stuff. We got enough solder for a couple dozen radios. A marker it was in there. It's valuable. Um, that screwdriver was not in there. I get mixed in there. Oh, there's a nice pair of needle nose. Um, those are Craftsman needle nose. They're made offshore. Um, there was a pretty heavy pair of pliers. I try not to use pliers or locking pliers too much on these projects, but uh, <clears throat> there was a resistor floating around in there for some reason. It's another bag of goodies. Um, at first glance, these look like these are just run-of-the-mill cheapy screwdrivers, you know, nothing special. Take it over here. That's not a battle screw. Now this is a different story. Um, this is a little set of Exolite M60 screwdrivers. This was Exolite's answer to the uh, jeweler screwdriver, and these are nice little screwdrivers. Which weird? Yeah, somebody cut that off. There should be another pouch down here, and there was a a bigger handle. They called it the torque amplifier. It basically slid over these little hex shapes. These are these are really very nice little screwdrivers. Every time I find these, I always get pretty excited. They're just a little baby screwdriver. And I don't think I don't know if Exolite even makes those anymore. Usually, when you find these, they're about a dollar. These are like thirteen or fourteen dollar screwdrivers. When I remember them last. <clears throat> Oh, we got a few screwdrivers, so. so we got probably enough tools to kind of get through the day here. Um, one thing I didn't show you, oh, I'm going to show you it anyway. I got a great big soldering copper that was a dollar. Uh, a little big for this project, but uh, interesting nonetheless. It was a soldering iron before electricity came along, and actually for a long time. It's probably more appropriate for, for you know, tin work. Um, this is a voltmeter I got for three bucks. And it's a Micronta. It's a Radio Shacks brand. It's uh, just a basic voltmeter. And we can you certainly use it. So, I don't know, I've probably got about 20... I'm just going to say, go out on a limb and say 25 bucks total um, in all this stuff here. So we're doing pretty good. 
Okay, well, where we come? Oh, and a. Uh... <laughs> <clears throat> oh, look, I found a schematic. <laughs> what that is, is a. Uh, it was like almost an icon on a website. Um, it was pretty small, so I downloaded just this and I blew it up a little bit. And you can you you can sort of get the gist of this. Um, like I told you before, we don't need a schematic, but it would be helpful. But if you look at this, um, you can kind of get a rough idea of what's going on, and it looks a lot like some other All American Five radios. Um, if I had to guess, this is the clock radio part right here. It seems like it's part of the radio, kind of off in the distance. Um, I bet that's the little jack, jack on the back. Let's see if we can make this better. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty pretty blurry. Um, that was probably the dial string. Actually, this has an interesting clue. Uh, right across here. Uh, something. Looks like 19, probably 52. Uh, it looks like most often needed radio diagrams. There was a series of little books called Most Often Needed Radio Diagrams. I want to say Bitumens or something. I can't remember the name, so if I got it wrong, you know, there's a strike against me somewhere in the universe. So that's a pretty helpful hint. Um, this is probably the radio layout here. This is how the dial string was strung, although it's just a, pretty much a blob. I bet a dollar that was the alignment. They had an interesting way of laying their schematics out. See these little lines here? This, there's kind of like a one big line. It divides it into sections, and usually what they did was they gave you some data. There was so many microvolts volts RF injected into the radio with a tone, and it may be down here, but this is the notes. And these are what each stage ought to have on it. That's actually a pretty interesting idea. Uh, fortunately, it's a useless blob here, but it does give you the basic um, kind of layout. If you have another radio schematic, you can really get an idea. Like I said, this is the clock radio part. This is the power supply, the rectifier tube, and its filaments. That's probably the noise cap, the one we saw that was blown up. Um, this is probably the audio section. This is the uh, detector and uh, AGC. I bet a dollar that that's the AGC resistor because these two leads look like they go back. And it use your imagination a little bit right there. It looks like it might even say AGC. You know, here's the antenna with the loop. Here's the converter. Here's the IF amp. Here's the two IF, uh, you know, bandpass or, or transformers. So you can get a pretty good idea what's going on. <clears throat> That's the volume control. Uh, yeah, like here. Looks like that's one of the filter sections. That might be the other. This is kind of interesting too because I was puzzling over that trans that audio transformer earlier, and it looks like here there's sort of a. You gotta use your imagination a little bit, but it looks like maybe that transformer might be center tapped, and one tap goes to the plate, and the other tap goes to the screen or whatever that is one of the yeah I believe that's the screen I'm having a kind of a brain fade here yeah, those are those, that's kind of a weird you see that stuff and go oh yeah that's the whatever it is but then when you say it out loud it never comes out right I don't know why that's the speaker there and the transformer um, there that's probably the cap to ground of course you can't read any of these values there's the local oscillator tank right there there's the tuning and stuff but what's helpful about this is this part um, I've actually got some of these books and I always forget I always forget that you know that uh, these books had schematics in them too a lot of these schematics are repeats in different books but these guys had some different stuff that was a little obscure and I'll have to do some digging around but it'll give us enough to get going. Well, so we kind of
kind of are set. And I'm not going to plug this baby in until we do some repairs. One repair that is definitely needed is that cap, that bumblebee cap. And if you look on the body of that thing, it's it's a yellow, purple, and looks like orange. And that's a .047 microfarad. That's pretty common for a, fil for a noise filter cap. And they use the same color codes as the resistor group, but some of the so the layout or the arrangement may be a little different. So you need to keep track of that. Now, this is pretty black. In, in, in retrospect, this whole area has been, this kind of L shape here has all been kind of black and probably from that cap. So I think what I'm going to do, uh, I'll take our soldering pencil we got a hold of here. No outlet close. Good thing I got the guy at the garage sale to throw in a cheap a lung cord. And the reason I got a hold of that is not because it was gonna to be too short here at the house. Um, actually these plugs, these things have really gotten expensive. They're like $13 nowadays. Just So we turn to uh, scavenging things out of garage sales, which is okay. Just do what you gotta do to get along. Not everybody's rich. Folks got a lot of money, if you want to send me some, I'll give you my address. You can have all, or I'll take all the money you want to give me. Oh. <sighs> Okay, so I'm going to pull this out. Uh, we can use our shiny new needle nose. They're a little needly. I don't like them that pointy. Maybe about half. Now, if you're really a brave, sometimes you can find these pliers at the cheap tool store, and they're about a dollar. Or if you go to the, you know, some sale somewhere, they're pretty inexpensive. Not like this, they're a little more. And if you get enough of them, you know, sometimes you can find a, a pretty good pile of them for a dollar. Um, don't be afraid to modify them and make them your own. You know, there's nothing to stop, especially the tips. Sometimes the tips, if they've been used, are all messed up and they're twisted out of shape. People are doing, you know, this and they get out of, out of alignment. You feel free to run them through the belt sand or the grinder to knock those down a little bit and make them all stiffer, more useful. Or there's nothing to stop you from getting out your propane torch, heating that end up and uh, putting it in your anvil and bending it over a little bit to make some hook pliers. Well, how are we doing? So is this hot? Yeah. Uh, I think we'll try the Radio Shack solder first. Okay. Well, we could use this small solder too. One of the things I do on solder, I don't... I really dislike having big rolls of solder on the table, and I really dislike um, doing the, you know, you start using it and this starts happening. What I do is I unreal uh, a bunch, you know, about that much, and I take and put a little, uh, wind the old end up, make a little catch there, and then I'll use this and put this giant blob away. It does a couple things. I have a bad habit of misplacing things. You know, I could lose my foot if it uh, wasn't inside my shoe. Um, and uh, this is a lot easier to work with. So now, for old radios, this solder is probably a little too small. You're going to have bigger connections. So what's going to happen is when you go to solder you're going to have to feed more wire in. It's going to be a little more annoying. This has got a little more meat to it, so it's going to take less, you know, feeding. But it's potato potato. This would really be great for small circuit boards, you know, where you don't need a lot of solder. But if you get a chance to get a pound, a one pound roll of solder for a dollar, I wouldn't turn it down. 
<clears throat> okay, dokie. So maybe a little wet rag is appropriate. I guess we're zoomed out. We'll just clean that baby up a little bit. How are we doing? Oh, that doesn't look too bad. That tip could use a little cleaning up, but it's not horrible. Well, so this might be hot enough to remove that lead. Now, I'm going to let that iron heat up a little bit more. I'm going to scooch you around a little bit here, and I'll be back in a tick. Well, one tick is passed, so we're back. Okie dokie. So what we're going to do here is, you're not going to be able to see, we'll look on this, I'll tell you what, we'll get over here. Look on this side. This is where the action is going to be. Hmm. Okay. So it looks like this connector <sighs> is uh, where that cap is hooked to. So I'm looking to see if there's anything else on that pin that I need to deal with. So we'll grab that cap with the old needle nose there. Get a little solder on the there. And we'll heat that baby up. Now this is entirely possible that this may not get hot enough to deal with this. Came right out. So what I'm gonna do is get a pencil. Just to keep track of that baby. that's something we can wipe off later and that next one is really crowded it looks like yeah it's right there you know um, this is where your uh, cell phone camera would shine you know take a little picture let me do some look and I might have some under tips these under tips um, just this end on screws. This is a pretty nice little gun. It's not burned up. The cord's a little twisted up, but there's nothing to cry about. So what you can't see on the back side, I've got the whole body of the cap now to uh, to use as a crowbar. To pull loose. So there are a lot of leads there. There we go. Okay. So we're out. And so you can see that baby just blew out. Man, did that thing blow out? What a mess! It's actually. And like some of the other paper caps, it kind of, they aren't polarized, but they are. Um, this little bead where it's been welded tells you the polarization. So, it's not critical, um, unless it's some weird RF application. Okay. Okay, so... The one thing we didn't get a hold of is any side cutters. Now, in the in the pliers there is a cutter section. Probably not. Yeah, it'll work. Super appropriate, but is usable. Okay. So down here